All right. So I'll share my screen and hopefully it'll work. Yes, we can see. You can see it? Which screen do you see? The one with the full screen or? Yeah, it's the full screen. Okay. So uh, anyway, so I'm gonna talk about uh, this emerging muon collider option to study Higgs physics going into the future. I suppose I should have talked after uh, Maria, who's gonna talk about HMLC program, but uh, well, uh, it's already 11 o'clock here. So uh, Kajri was kind enough to uh, let me go first. So that's good. Uh, and I've had a long day because we had USCMS meeting happening in, uh, uh, in Madison. So I haven't had as much time as I should have had to prepare this talk. I should have worked on it earlier, but here I am. And uh, hopefully I won't do too shoddy a job. So uh, here's the thing. So the reason why we are talking about, uh, looks like this is not working. So um, the reason why we're talking about this in the US lately, and that's why probably I got invited and why I got thinking about this emerging beyond collider option lately uh, is because uh, I think that uh, we need to go beyond the HLLC to answer some of the questions. And the kind of questions that we want to answer is something that we put together in, as part of a community study in the, in the US uh, a few years ago. And we are in the midst of that particular study yet again. Last time around, we got the HLL, let's see, with these goals of studying the following five areas. It turns out that three of those areas are what are being addressed by the HLL, let's see. And it turns out that on a very broad level, it's the same, same areas that we have been stuck with uh, even at 10 years of, after the run two, if you like, 10 years of discovery of the Higgs, and we're still in the same situation that we need to use the Higgs as a discovery tool, and we need to identify the dark matter physics. In the interim years, we found that the scales of energy have moved higher and higher, and uh, uh, I think that we will need new machines. And that's the conclusion that um, a lot of people uh, have drawn and that the European study group uh, a few years ago, uh, two years ago, I guess now, has come up with a plan and they have a well executed um, study program and they came up with the idea that we should do the future circular collider uh, with an electron option to, stu uh, to study the Higgs at great depth and then go on to do the FCCPP where uh, you continue that and discover any a new physics associated with that. As for the new physics, Higgs is really playing a central role there. This is one of the, you know, in the, as part of the new community study, we are in the midst of this and we just wrote a document and one of the pictures in the document is this little thing, which basically says that Higgs is sort of central to very many fundamental topics. We got into this business to break the electroweak symmetry uh, and then realize that the Higgs mass corrections uh, have profound implications. And uh, um, if by naturalness arguments, we, th we thought we should see new physics at a TV scale. Well, we spent the last five years doing the run two and its analysis. And we found that, well, maybe not one TV, maybe nature is after all not so natural. Maybe it is just a little bit beyond natural. So maybe it is 10 TV scale, which is important. Um, it has other uh, implications as well. Is the Higgs potential exactly the way it is that we think in the standard model? That has implications on the stability of the universe. We still don't understand why uh, so many uh, mass matrix related uh, things that, uh, that are so different than what you would naturally expect in, uh, in a theory. And uh, I think that um, Starting the Higgs is probably a good way to move forward. And it's not just me, it's a majority of the community, I'd say, is very interested in studying the Higgs to a percent level precision. A percent level precision, if you find any deviations to the Higgs coupling at percent level, then it points to about 10 TV as the new scale. And that requires a new machine. 
And uh, that's one of the things that we're thinking of. Do we do it in two machines or do we do it in one? That's the, uh, that's the thing. And I want to convince you that Muon Collider is a very interesting option. And I'll tell you a little bit about what uh, the simulation studies are indicating, but it's a, it's a beginning story. That's why I call it emerging uh, a Muon Collider thing. So why am I giving this talk? First of all, some disclaimer that I'm not an accelerator physicist. I'm not really a build, detector building expert. Uh, I did not work sufficiently on any of the future Collider programs. So I basically lifted slides from other people. Uh, I do not have any official leadership position anywhere, so I'm just presenting my personal views here. So those are my disclaimers. But I do have to say that I have certain qualifications, which I would like to uh, tell you why I came to this conclusion. One of them is that I've worked at E plus A minus machines, uh, the SLD, which is uh, at the first linear collider. I worked at Babar, which is a very high intensity uh, a plus E minus machine, the Higgs uh, B factory, if you like. I worked at uh, in measuring, understanding the proton structure first, first with fixed target experiments and then Zeus and Hera. And I spent a whole lot of time since 1994 on CMS, uh, working on design of the trigger system and measuring various things. So I do know a little bit of something about this. So maybe uh, my understanding may be useful to you to, in coming to your own conclusion about uh, whether muon colliders are feasible, if they're interesting, if, should, if we should pursue uh, something in that line or not. So I basically use the advantages of clean E plus E minus collisions. I think that they're great and that would be uh, something that we want. Uh, and I know what the limitations are, uh, E plus E minus. So maybe other leptons is the right way to go. Um, and I also have worked at the CMS and I know the energy reach of the proton colliders and how much more beneficial they are. So uh, as I say, the observations are, uh, I hope are unbiased because I have a broad training, but on the other hand, uh, they could be very biased as well because it's my personal opinion. That's what I'm telling you about. So, uh, so I would say, please consider any perceived biases as the debate points and let's, uh, Let's talk about that in the Q&A time. I hope I have plenty of time reserved for that. So uh, as I said, there's a community consensus, I think, that measuring Higgs couplings to 1% is potentially a portal to new physics. At least it'll tell us if the 10 TV scale is interesting or not. Um, now, measuring Higgs self-coupling going requires going beyond HLLHC. Maybe Maria will argue that HLLHC is enough, but I think that going beyond HLL, let's see, is sort of needed for doing something like that. And that would probably take a multi-TV machine. And so uh, multi-TV partonic center of mass, that is, right? So I think that direct access to 10 TV scale uh, is important. Uh, and we can try to understand the Higgs in detail and also get to the 10 TV scale together and the question is, how do you get uh, a strategy to realize both these goals? And I would like to argue that um, it would be good to do something like a Mion Collider and do both of them together. Uh, but that's um, minority view. The majority view, if you like, the European study group has done a lot of work on it. This is one of the slides that, uh, that was put up and a while ago. I am sure that uh, this horizontal axis shifts around in one direction uh, over a period of time. And some of these uh, little boxes here get stretched out. So the details don't really matter. What matters is the time scales we're talking about. And many of these time scales are well beyond my lifetime and probably uh, the youngest members of the collaboration will probably be retiring in 2080 whenever uh, these machines uh, come to fruition like the FCCHS. So it's, these are very long, long time scales. Um, now, unfortunately, these long time scales have a problem. The topmost thing there is the ILC, which we have been waiting forever. Basically, this whole thing is sliding for a long time now, and maybe it is doomed. I have no idea. And the reason for that is cost, primarily cost, right? Otherwise, Japanese would have done it. If it's a few billion, you know, two, three billion dollar facility, they would have done it. It's really a $10 billion facility. And that's the problem. And uh, they are not able to make a commitment to do it. Maybe they will, maybe not. I don't know. 
the Chinese enthusiastically started on uh, trying to do something. And uh, I don't know if they will manage to do it, but uh, there is fairly limited co cooperation, if you like, in a globally and trying to do a machine in, in, uh, uh, in China. I think the only real game in town is the uh, CERN's preferred road, if you like, to go through FCCEE for several years, followed by uh, um, change of uh, the accelerator to a high field magnet based proton proton machine. And it's a fairly long process. And depending on whether they want to do a higher energy FCCE run beyond the uh, 250 GV nominal fixed factory run, it's going to uh, it's going to take a long time to get there. That frustrates it. But another aspect is also frustrating some of us. Uh, for a long time, we've been talking about three regions where high energy physics is done sort of globally in Asia and Europe and North America. And the collider options in North America have somehow withered away. And uh, what we're trying to do is try to get that back online. So that's the context in which I'm involved. So just to set the scale, so I just gave you a long spiel about why I'm doing this talk. Uh, the snow mass is an interesting process where the community comes together and tries to talk about various options. And so options it is. And in order to compare them some years ago, they invented a unit called snow mass year, which is 10 to the seven seconds. It's important to know uh, how much data you're going to get per year. Um, it, just to set the scale, the approved machine that we are all hoping will run at, uh, at uh, between 200 and 500 in with femtobans per year, uh, year being a snow mass year um, in the next two decades. So that's what we're looking at. That's the only thing, only game in town. Now that's a 14 TV machine uh, to two significant figures. And I think what matters more is the photonic center of mass, which we're talking about as a two TV machine. And it's 27 kilometers in circumference, right? That's pretty big, but we do have the tunnel. Uh, it costs $10 billion, by the way, to build that thing without including the civil engineering. And what's being uh, uh, proposed by the international E plus E minus community is this ILC, which is a 31 kilometer linear machine. And uh, as you can see, um, uh, it's pretty big because the acceleration gradient is not very high, but it only has reach. You know, this is all per, uh, the E plus E minus center of mass, right? Fundamental particles at 250 GeV or 500 GeV. And also the luminosity is, uh, is not quite where uh, one would like to be uh, I would say. So ideally, we'd like to run at 500 and 180, but the starting point, we're talking about 250 and 75, and the estimates for the costs of this machine are so high that nobody has signed on to do it. So what we decided to, uh, well, there's another machine that people had been talking about for much longer time, I would say, but it hasn't really taken off for some reason, and the European strategy group seemed to have put it mock ball that that's the even bigger E plus E minus machine um, at click. So what's now the favorite option from some point of view is this gigantic machine, a hundred kilometer machine. And uh, it's, you know, that that is great. And unfortunately it's gonna be very expensive. So they stretched out the time and put an E plus E minus option first so you can do the Higgs machine, uh, Higgs studies in detail initially, and then do the um, uh, PP machine. You'll hear a lot more about it. It's an exciting program. Um, and by default, I think that's where we are headed. The question is, can we do something a little bit more um, uh, realizable financially and maybe technologically more, uh, more interesting. Those are the parts that we have. So in the US, uh, very late comer to the program is this machine called C Cube that uh, some of us have been promoting. I won't talk very much about it other than in the slide, just to tell you that it's a, uh, it's a E plus E minus machine, but the acceleration gradient is significantly higher and it's been revised. So hopefully, uh, it'll be much uh, more affordable and it can fit on the Fermilab site. So that's one of the options that we're exploring. But I won't talk very much about it. 
What I'm going to talk about is the muon collider. And um, now there are many options suggested for the center of mass and all of that. But I think that as in the past um, six months or so, we have converged to two possible scenarios, uh, a 10 TeV machine with, uh, 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 with 10 inverse out-of-bound capability. So that means about a thousand uh, um, inverse femtobonds per year for 10 years of operation. That's what we want, I think. Uh, now, uh, such a machine would have the accelerating part of it would be about 27 kilometer. And that's a number which, which is interesting because that actually can fit in the, um, that is the uh, lab tunnel or the LHC tunnel, if you like. And that's a natural uh, thing. So there's a group of people who are now based at CERN, actually, the IMCC, the International Muon Collider, has started investigating uh, a muon collider option. So that's one of the uh, scenarios, and that's my favorite scenario, a 10 TV machine with about uh, 10 inverse atom bonds uh, and, uh, uh, to do all the physics, if you like. Uh, there's also a proposal for 3 TV as a starting point. I'm not going to say very much about it. Uh, I personally think that we do want to go to 10 TV. So about six or seven years ago in the United States, there was a proposal that was submitted to the, uh, the snow mass process as we call it, uh, which talked about a, a 125 GV. So mu plus mu minus goes to Higgs uh, in the S channel. That has some interesting features, but if you notice, it has got very, very, oops, I don't know what I did. Uh, it has very, very low luminosity and uh, somehow that fell off the uh, scheme, if you like. So I won't be talking very much about it. So I'll talk mostly about a 10 TV machine. So that's my focus today. Uh, you know, uh, this yeah. kilometers of conference part that you showed in previous slide, uh, was that for keeping the veteran um, in, in mind, I mean, reusing some part of the Tevatrum? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, so I, I'll show another picture where you can see how, how a new machine would look like on a Fermilab site. The Tevatron uh, tunnel is just not suitable uh, for this. So it will have to be new civil engineering if it is done at Fermilab. It will have to be a site filler for the accelerating uh, part of the uh, Muon Collider is kind of weird. So you'll look at the structure, how it looks like in a little while and we'll see. Uh, you'll okay. see. Is, it, so, is, the C -cube is, is the C-Cube is a linear collider or a circular one? Uh, C-Cube is linear collider. Uh, it's, it's a E plus E minus linear collider, warm technology. Uh, well, it's called cool copper collider. It's warm technology in the sense that it's not superconducting, but it is that little less than the liquid nitrogen temperature. And the idea is that uh, it helps uh, improve the power performance of the machine and it also improves the robustness. And they also decided to feed the RF into the accelerating structures in a very different way compared to, uh, let's say the original linear collider at Slack. And that allows them to get to gradients of 150 uh, MeV per meter. That's what makes it much more uh, interesting. We can talk about it in the Q&A. I don't want to uh, stress too much about that right now. If you don't okay. All right. So uh, the assumptions about luminosity depend on the run plan, which is, of course, completely variable over a period of time. So in this particular uh, slide, I think, which I got from Maria in one of her papers, I think that's, uh, that's the paper that they did as part of the Higgs working group, so this slide ignores when the start point is, but it has got a comparison, if you like, of machines assuming certain run plans for ILC, for CPC and so on. And uh, it's a long program, as you can see, it takes you know, T0 to 26 years. So we're talking about a couple of decades of uh, data collection uh, and, uh, and what that will enable. Uh, so this one does not have any Vion Collider yet, right? So with comparing the plus and minus machines and the FCC, well, what they were talking about is that uh, FCC EE in particular, if you look at it, the performance, you know, FCC EE with its higher luminosity does a little bit better, but not substantially 
better. But of course, the FCC HF will take over and, and uh, do a fantastic job. Except as we saw, it's 2090 by the time you get to that level. So if you look at it in a different level, I talked about HICSEF coupling earlier. If you want to make uh, measurements, uh, HLLSC, as we were talking about, is at the level of uh, 50, uh, um, uh, 50 or so, whereas 50% uh, or so, whereas uh, if you, you really need FCCHH in this scenario to get down to something, uh, something um, that the dark, darkest blue is including the FCCHH. If you want to get below 10%, so you really need the uh, FCC. Um, the ILC with the higher energy option with a TV uh, will get uh, close to that. But again, that's a very long and a very expensive program. Um, now Click uh, 3TV, of course, does a very good job also, but again, a long program. So uh, the question is, can we do better? And so uh, we have been investigating this. Can we have one collider which will do both these uh, tasks, get to 10 TV scale, and also see if there are deviations in, at 10 TV? So uh, there was a program called MAP, which was a US uh, muon accelerator program. And they had investigated various options. And I think that the favorite option at the moment is really using a proton driver. So you use very intense proton source and uh, put it on a target. And then of course the muons are all uh, diverging away from the axis and you have to get them back cooled. And that cooling is a very expensive proposition. Uh, so it needed a tremendous amount of uh, work to get down. The, the advantage of muse, using the muons, of course, is that you can accelerate them and uh, turn them around in a very tight circle and have very compact machines. Uh, so compact that uh, the civil engineering costs now dwarf the, um, the rest of the cost. The machine costs and the technical challenges, there are many. There were other options that people talked about, perhaps producing muons from, uh, uh, from uh, positrons by annihilating them in, uh, in, in uh, electrons in, in a hydrogen gas or something like that, or beryllium usually, and uh, produce, uh, uh, let's say, 20 RG, uh, 20 RGV muons uh, and uh, mu plus and mu minus and, and use them. Those would be very collimated because, you know, muon is 105 MeV versus uh, 20 some odd GeV momentum. So they'll be very collimated. So you can get rid of the uh, cooling step. Uh, but of course you need a very intense positron source. And I think that the latter part is abandoned. So we're really talking more about this, right? Uh, so what, what does muon help? Well, first of all, you can make it compact. And the second thing is a fundamental particle. So center of mass and energy on the order of uh, 10 to 15 GeV, uh, TV is equivalent basically to a proton machine of 100 TV or so uh, for most processes, if you like. And that's fantastic. The other big advantage of that is that uh, by the time you get to 10 uh, TV in the center of mass of the muon, uh, the cross section which dominates is the W boson fusion. And uh, those cross sections are of course flat or mildly increasing as they get to higher energies. So the higher the energy, uh, the better it is. Um, uh, and uh, 10 TV is already in a good spot. So that's the thing that we want to talk about. So if you want to make a machine uh, at, um, at, uh, uh, at Fermilab, this is the map of Fermilab and it would sort of, you know, this is a, I think a six TV machine would have this size. And if you're making a, uh, a 10 TV machine, it'll basically be a site filler, if you like, it will just fill up this Fermilab site. This is an important thing if it is going to be a US project because it's very hard in the US to put accelerator under somebody's home or even under somebody's farm. Uh, people have guns there, you might have heard about it. So I think it's not a good idea. So uh, that's one of the reasons why we stick to that. Whereas in Europe, that's not a problem. So they went overboard and they're talking about uh, a 100 kilometer tunnel, but who knows if that's doable or not. But we do have this 15 TV 
uh, uh, machine that can fit inside a uh, inside the our favorite tunnel where we have the LHC right now. So that looks like a wonderful place to build uh, build something. Um, so yeah, these are feasible in some reasonable space, but even better in many respects. So click. Uh, uh, somewhat um, uh, step back, maybe uh, the click proponents will argue differently, but uh, it lost a little bit of momentum, primarily because of this plot, which is basically showing the luminosity uh, that, uh, that you can get given, P here is the power. And given a certain power, um, uh, the luminosity, uh, as you go to higher energy, it's actually things are getting worse as you go to 3 TV. So this becomes very, very expensive. Whereas for a muon collider, a very interesting thing happens, which is that the higher the energy, the more uh, efficient it is for, for given power in producing luminosity. So it actually scales up very inter interestingly. Daniel Schulte, who is now leading the international uh, beyond collider collaboration, which uh, which is actually at CERN. So this uh, IMCC has been formed at CERN. It's partially uh, it's funded by them to to some extent. Daniel is to work on Click and is now the IMCC um, uh, uh, spokesperson, if you like. So what does this mean? What it means is this is a slide that I stole from Fabio Maltoni, who gave a talk to us at the, in, in the US uh, a few months ago. So uh, the Muon Collider is teeny in size compared to the uh, FCC. And here we're talking about FCC E and FCC HH, which has to produce the physics that we need. And it takes a long time to make this construction. And we believe that five years of operation at 10, at a Muon Collider uh, at 10 TV is equivalent to something on the order of uh, uh, 40 years of operation of FCC E followed by FCC HH. Now you have to take it with a ton of salt, forget the grains here. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done still to see if this is reasonable. So the point is where do these five years begin? So there's still a lot of R&D to be done, but I think that there's a good hope uh, to be optimistic about it. So let me first start by say, telling you what are the optimistic things about it by in simulation, if you like. So one of the things is, the thing that I started out saying that we want to measure the Higgs couplings to a percent level. And uh, this is a table that's compiled recently, uh, which in the copper framework, we're looking at what the HLLHC can do, which is uh, which probably should have been the first talk before I got to this, but anyway, here we are. And if you use HLLHC and the 10 TV machine, uh, you get this column of numbers. I think that's more easy to look at this plot. But anyway, we looked at the numbers HLLC alone, HLLC with a 10 TV muon collider, and also assuming that there is an intermediate uh, lepton collider, let's say an ILC or a C cube. And uh, um, in, in those cases, in here we are comparing uh, how uh, the muon collider at 3 TV versus 10 TV versus 14 TV versus 30 TV uh, center of mass will do with luminosities appropriately scaled, if you like, because the luminosity at 10 TV will be about 10 inverse vector bands or so, no, 10 inverse auto bands or so. So as you can see in this picture here, they're comparing to the FCC HH and, you know, 10 TV muon collider does all, all um, almost as well. Actually, they're the best case scenario for FCC HH, if you like. Um, there, uh, and uh, it was better than click. And, and uh, the Muon Collider at 3TV, comparing to Click at 3TV, is actually a little bit worse. Um, the reason is that Muon Collider is not that trivial. It's more noisy, if you, I mean, more background, if you like, and the measurements are not as easy as in a uh, E plus E minus machine. So you can see some of these features already in here. So how would we do in, uh, in uh, Dihigs production? This is something uh, that I stole from uh, Tahan and company. Uh, and you can see that uh, with the, uh, with the, uh, with the Muon Collider, you can do significantly uh, better uh, in, in many respects. 
So that's good. Uh, so this is the same thing again in the copper framework that Jason, this is from one of the documents that we're putting together for the snow mass process. And it shows that uh, a, a machine uh, at three TV is okay, but the 10 TV machine looks even better. And if somehow, uh, if you're able to get a good measurement of the uh, Higgs uh, width, now that's something which is doable using 125 GeV beyond collider, if you like, then you can do even better. Uh, in some channels. For instance, if you look at the mu mu, uh, that really, really does very well, right? But a 10 TV muon collider overall uh, gets below the uh, percent level that we're talking about. So what can we do with something like percent level? Here's a paragraph from our, uh, from our paper that we're just writing right now. Basically it says that if you have, let's say for instance, in this particular case, we're looking colored particles. So uh, we're looking at the deviation from the, um, from the uh, gluon, uh, indirect gluon coupling. So there are these new particles, new colored particles going around in the loop and causing the Higgs to decay to gamma gamma. And if you measure that at a certain precession, uh, certain precision, so we talked about what that is, that's 0.67 in this picture. And if you put that in, we're probing a scale of 1.5 TeV. So it does what we said we should do with a precision uh, Higgs factory. But at the same time, this is a machine where uh, you can go to root S over two in producing these stops. So if there is such a stop, and if you find a deviation at this level, you can actually discover that stop because you have 10 TV. So you can uh, get to uh, mass scales for these stops to up to five, to ten, uh, five TV at a 10 TV machine. So that's the advantage. You can measure the, um, the Higgs coupling. And if you find any deviations, you know exactly what to expect. And uh, you can actually validate that you had a, a colored uh, supersymmetric partner that we discovered, if you like. So here, here's one example. There are many examples that one can look at. Uh, what can you do if the Higgs sector is a bit more complicated? Well, that was two, uh, that is 2HDMN, right? It's uh, MSSM of some kind. But we're talking only about the standard model like Higgs and everything else is very high scale. So here, for instance, if we have a, um, uh, a, an extension with a Higgs singlet, and let's call that M phi, and if you're looking at M phi masses, you know the, the singlet has got a very high mass, right? So we're talking about uh, things here with various ranges. So here's the exclusion plot. So here's a mixing angle that you have to deal with, and you can see that compared to the HLLSC. Uh, as you go to high, uh, you know, 10 TV is over here. So it covers slightly different parameter space, but here you can see that it's not as good as a 100 TV proton-proton uh, machine. But if you go to 30 TV, you win. So 30 TV is ideal, but of course, no, that's a lot more uh, complicated problem to deal with. Uh, looks like I put the same plot twice, so I'll just leave that. Um, uh, here, for instance, if you're looking at dark matter, um, uh, now this is dark matter in uh, scenarios where you have uh, a, an electroweak, a new electroweak uh, multiplet, and this is the size of the multiplet, if you like, and you know, if you think about it, maybe this is probably the right thing. So uh, this is Higgs Reno like, uh, and this is Reno like dark matter, as they call it, because of uh, the various. Uh, written. So you can, uh, depending on the center of mass energy, here at Lantau and company went overboard and they even looked at uh, 100 TV. So the relevant thing is to look at the yellow thing. This is perhaps one of the harder things to do. And uh, uh, HLI, let's see, reach will be uh, less, than a, uh, less than a TV. Whereas if you want something which will fit the cosmological models and get appropriate relic density, you need to get higher. So 10 TV machine just gets there, if you like. Uh, it would be nicer if we can get to even higher energy. So it's possible that we might, we might want to go even higher in energy, but 10 TV is a good goal is what we thought. Here's another situation again, you know, whenever you talk about colored particles, you can see uh, the, uh, the advantage of a proton machine versus, uh, versus a muon collider. Here, the darker shade is just the HLMC, lighter shade is with, with the FCCHH, and the muon collider is this flat lines here, 
for each of these cases because they're all pay per views and it can be the same independent of the final state. So it's 10 TV, 14 TV, and 30 TV. So if you get 30 TV, you just rule it for sure. 10 TV, well, but the electro uh, uh, for non colored particles like these two guys, uh, it, it's, it, it's better, but uh, for uh, colored particles, the stops and the squarks, uh, FCC is still ahead compared to 10 TV, but a 30 TV machine will fly. So 15 TV is somewhere in between. Um, that's what I would say about what kind of physics that one can do. It's interesting and lots of access, uh, slightly different from the FCC PP, but it can do many things uh, in a competitive way or maybe even better. So now uh, Beyond Collider is weird. So I picked this picture so you can see it. So we talked a little bit about the structure here we have an intense proton source and the pions decay, make the muons, and then you need to cool the muons so that they're collimated. And then you have acceleration and then you have put it into a big ring. And this is the ring, which will be 27 kilometers if it is done in the, in the left tunnel, which is apparently doable. Uh, but then once you accelerate them, you need to um, uh, uh, collide them in a small ring. So there is a little bit of civil engineering to do and you could have a couple of IPs. And um, the kind of center of mass as people looked at, uh, you know, looking at it in terms of the um, collider circumference. In principle, uh, the collider itself is very small. It's the, it's the accelerator ring, which is much bigger. And that needs to be something like a site filler at Fermilab or something like the lab tunnel or the LHC tunnel. Uh, to uh, to work, but the uh, new engineering work, if it is done at CERN, but, uh, the civil engineering work is minimal compared to uh, what an FCC would have to do. Okay, uh, rest of the parameters doesn't matter, but uh, one key thing that you see is that as you get increase the center of mass energy, the instantaneous luminosity goes up, and that's what allows us to get to 10 inverse atoms at 10 TeV. All right. So what are the things that are done to even believe any of these things? So towards the muon collider, what have we done? Well, uh, here are the things that have been sort of uh, demonstrated. There's more work to be done in all of these areas. Don't get me wrong there. But well, what has been done is that one of the big problems is that in this cooling uh, section here, you have a very, very high field solenoid. And when you talk about high field solenoid, we're talking about uh, 30, 40 Tesla magnets. And it turns out that ITERs, and they have to be big apertures so that it can capture the very wide beam inside. And uh, as you call it, they can, you call it by sending it through some kind of, uh, it, you know, that requires a, a big, uh, big capture uh, solenoid. So 40 TS Tesla, yeah, more work needs to be done perhaps radiation resistant, uh, high temperature superconductor based things need to be uh, done. So there's still some more work to be done, but there is a example solenoid in existence, which, uh, which is a good proof of principle. Uh, now cooling requires uh, a lot of things to be demonstrated further. As I was talking about earlier, you need this, uh, not only very high field magnets, uh, you also need um, RF, which, which provides very high um, uh, magnetic field and uh, a very fast ramping up and down to, uh, to make the cooling happen. So that's a big deal. Uh, that still needs work, but it has been uh, demonstrated uh, to some extent and, and, and so on. So uh, I think that this is a point which is sort of repeated. Um, the other thing is that the muon acceleration in principle uh, is fairly straightforward, except that you need very fast ramping magnets. And that work still requires a little bit of magnet development, probably 10 years of work or something like that. Uh, the other thing which uh, bothered me last time I looked at the Muon Collider about seven or eight years ago and dismissed it as this is a dumb idea was the backgrounds because the muons are not stable particles, they decay, you make electrons and positrons, and they're gonna hit all sorts of um, beam elements and produce tons of crap going through the detector. How can you do physics in it? That uh, simply uh, looked formidable. 
But I think that the newer detector technologies that people have been talking about and uh, improved uh, cost performance for getting to very, very large number of channels in the calorimeters and in very small feature size on the tracker and having this um, uh, segmentation helps reduce the thing. And some of the simulation seems to indicate that we may be able to get there. And another key feature there is the timing performance. The newer detectors have uh, really excellent uh, time resolution for signals and that allows using another dimension to, so to speak, remove the um, uh, basically uh, shower background from the decay remnants of the muon. Uh, they are basically going horizontally through the detector, so they don't have the same timing characteristics as something that uh, some particle that is originating in the, uh, at, the, um, at the collision point in the center of the detector. A lot of this work is documented in a gen volume. If you click on this, you'll, uh, you'll see that. So here is, for instance, one example. Um, he, uh, frankly, I must say that I'm a little bit underwhelmed by looking at these plots, but it is actually an interesting demonstration of cooling. What you see here, uh, this is the cooling structure that they use. So, the, uh, so basically, uh, the decays of the pions will send the muons through this uh, through this structure. And what you're seeing is measurements made here compared to measurements made here. So the upstream tracker performance and the downstream tracker performance. And what you're seeing here is that if you uh, if you have uh, basically a, um, a beam and it goes through the detector. So this is the upstream, uh, uh, basically the count, and you can see that. And all that's happening if you have uh, an empty target here, just the, uh, just the empty target, no liquid hydrogen in there. All that happens is that it just truncates it, right? You're just losing all this part of the uh, beam. That's not particularly useful. Basically, that's just collimation, and you don't want that. But if you actually fill it with liquid hydrogen, you can see that some of this tail, which has reduced, is restored here in this section here, right? In fact, you don't even need to use the liquid hydrogen target. You could use lithium hydride, uh, which basically you're looking for low atomic uh, weight material. And you see essentially the same effect that uh, some of the tail here is pushed back in here. So you're basically cooling the beam. Now there's a lot more work that needs to be done. This level is obviously not uh, going to be sufficient to get all the muons in. Uh, but that's something that's done. The other big problem people worried about, I thought this was crazy, but uh, it turns out it is a big deal. So there are two rings shown here, the, uh, the accelerator ring and the collider ring. So uh, if you have uh, muons, as they're going around in here, uh, 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 sorry, this is just a, uh, a circle around the collider ring. So we're looking at where the neutrinos are exiting. So as the muons are going around, except the two straight sections where you would put the detectors, you see that the muons uh, produce neutrinos and they spread around except that in this straight section where you're going to put the detector, there are a lot of uh, muons going through and they're going to decay. And when they decay, of course, you got this mess in the detector, which we'll talk about in a second. But the other thing that happens is that you produce this collimated uh, neutrinos and those neutrinos all exit the, uh, the earth at some point. And this is not very good because the radiation in this area by basically neutrinos interacting with matter is high enough that uh, people are concerned about it. So that requires doing something about it. Uh, one way of uh, mitigating it is to actually uh, uh, go deep underground, if you like. Uh, so if you go deeper into the thing, so for instance, LHC, a uh, tunnel is 100 meter deep. So it's possible for us to go to 100 meter deep and create a tunnel which, uh, which, will, uh, which will mitigate the problem to some extent. The other thing that one can do is dither the uh, muon beam uh, in such a way that the, we spread them uh, across in, in the, uh, also. So people are working on figuring out how to minimize the neutrino background. Uh, 
The other thing, as I was saying, is that when the muon decays, you got the electrons and they're going to hit all sorts of material and produce very high energy particles. Uh, but they're all going to shower and make a lot of low energy deposits in the detector. So what's shown here in these pictures, one, two, three, are uh, the fluxes, if you like. So the number of beam induced particles, we call them BIP particles uh, in different species, neutrons, photons, and electrons. And this is the momentum. And this is the arrival time on the horizontal axis and the Z position. Uh, yeah, it looks like we can use the timing. If you have precision timing, yeah, maybe we can reduce the background quite a bit. Uh, that's one thought, right? The collision is gonna happen at a particular point. It's not that you eliminated it, you still have quite a bit of background, but you can get rid of, this goes on forever, right? And you can get rid of some of that. Uh, uh, you can use, uh, the position variation as a mechanism to mitigate some of these things. So we're investigating uh, using highly segmented detectors, some timing cuts, some energy cuts. In case of tracker, perhaps we can use the CMS design where we have uh, double layers and you can use the uh, correlations to get rid of the background. So these are single hit backgrounds, if you like. So people have simulated some of these things. So and can you actually reconstruct the tracks of interest coming from the, uh, from the uh, interaction point? And the answer turns out to be, yeah, we can do it quite reasonably. So what's shown here is at various angles, the, these are just single particles which thrown, uh, including the bits, single muons thrown at a 13 degree angle in red, 30 degree angle in, uh, in uh, theta, and 89 degree angle in, uh, in black. And you can see that the efficiency is actually pretty good. Of course, if it's going vertical, yeah, 89 degrees, it's very, very good. And if it is even when it's going pretty horizontal, where there may be a lot more background and difficult to uh, um, get the bend, if you like, it's still pretty high uh, in efficiency. And uh, the lower thing is showing you what the uh, resolution of uh, track resolution will be for various momentum. We're talking about one GB here. So for most particles, we're talking about 10 TV in the center of mass. So we're interested more or less in uh, order 10 GV particles and jets to be reconstructed well so that you can make jets. And we seem to be doing it very well uh, at various angles of the, of the detector. So people have written jet algorithms, simple jet algorithms, and looked at B jets and C jets and uh, like quark jets, and you can actually uh, um, uh, the resolution is not bad at all. So one can do uh, physics with uh, in an environment like that is a thought, but a lot more research is of course needed. So uh, what are the key areas of investigation going forward? Uh, talking about uh, further developing the physics potential, especially taking into account the beam induced background and its mitigation. The neutrino flux mitigation still requires more uh, study. That's a safety issue. So if you want to build a machine like this, you better demonstrate uh, in a very uh, uh, conservative way that this will uh, this will not impact uh, quality of life anywhere. Um, there are uh, other issues which have to do with the high energy. Uh, to get to the acceleration. So people in MAP have investigated lower energy options. So the 10 TeV, which is, seems to be what is favored right now uh, by the science community, requires further optimization and a better design. And this uh, and the cooling thing, we need to do it at a higher brightness so we have something to talk about. So what are the proposed timelines? So we looked at the schedules of, uh, of the other machines um, uh, that are proposed and try to see where we would fit in. So, uh, well, this is a slide where I was trying to sell both uh, C-cube and MUCOL, so I have the C-cube in there. But the muon collider, as, you, as I discussed in the last few, sec uh, few minutes, there's still quite a few challenges, a lot of work to do. So there's a lot of this gray area where you're still doing uh, quite a bit of uh, um, uh, uh, R&D and then doing the construction. So it, uh, I don't know exactly when it will begin, but some, something on the order of 
2040, uh, uh, 2045 is probably doable for a 10 TV uh, uh, collider. One in was out of one per year, so you have a 10 year run to get to 10 TV, 10 in was out of one. It's actually not so bad. Now, uh, by the way, so the FCCE is running here, and this point here is where this is joining. For some reason, this plot was made like this. So this time scale is actually sitting outside this plot by quite a bit. So we think that maybe muon collider is a faster and more economical path to get there if the technology actually uh, uh, works out. It's not proven yet, but if it turns out that the technology uh, can be uh, developed in the next few years of our research, it will be more economical and perhaps uh, allowable within about uh, the budgets that we can possibly afford. So the question is, should developing these emerging scenarios be part of our global effort? My answer is a resounding yes. Uh, I hope I've convinced you that that's something that, that interests you. So as I was saying, it's just one ring to rule them all. We'll explore Higgs sector fully. And, may, and if you find discrepancies, maybe even explore the BSM directly. There was much enthusiasm, as I said, in the Fino and the experiment community. Uh, the rest of it, uh, you can read. I'll leave the slide here from the Mion Collider, uh, International Mion Collider report that they submitted to us. And they're saying we could probably operate this kind of machine in uh, 2040s. Uh, provided uh, it's only limited technically. So there's a lot of work to do. So that's why the schedule is where it is. And of course, the reality needs to be put in when the funds can be realized and things like that. However, uh, this is what I wanted to say, which I forgot. Uh, the International Beyond Collider Collaboration has formed and they're actively encouraging groups uh, to sign up and participate. I hope uh, Indian community will also join that effort at some level. Uh, and uh, CERN is already supporting R&D in this. Uh, I know FCC is their main effort, but this is sort of a background level effort that they're doing. And the US is evaluating, um, uh, you know, in the previous snow mass cycle, we just dropped the Mion Collider and we're trying to see if we can uh, resuscitate it and uh, push forward on that. So Indian community is welcome to join as well. So I stop here. Thank you, Shudar, for the very interesting talk. Uh, okay, so we can go over the questions if there are any. I see one hand raised. Yeah, Kajri, please go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Shudar, I might have missed it. Uh, what is the justification for having the um, accelerator ring larger than the actual ring, collider ring? Um. So uh, the accelerator yeah. ring has this fast ramping magnets and things like that. And uh, a lot of, uh, uh, it, it, it's just a question of uh, uh, cost related uh, things for whether you, in principle, you could do it in a smaller ring, but that would require a different RF and uh, higher, um, not an accelerator business. I may be giving you completely wrong answer, but uh, the acceleration done in a more relaxed way using the bigger ring is, is, is nice. And at CERN, for instance, they have a 27 kilometer one. So to use it is the right thing. Otherwise you have to accelerate using much higher gradient. By the way, in the Beyond Collider, there's just one bunch. It just goes through and that's it. And we're going to collide it till it decays, but it, the beam lifetime is not particularly large. And you want to keep that as small as possible so that you're not spending forever for the next collision to happen because it's going around in a larger circle. So you want the collider to be as small as possible and the acceleration, you don't want to spend as much and it's better to have it uh, more relaxed if you like. That's my crude answer. Yeah, I will go through, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, next is yeah. Arnab. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, first of all, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, what is the status of the laser plasma-based accelerators? I mean, 
because that that was That's one a completely different talk i suppose i'm not qualified to give that talk but i've heard uh, quite a few talks lately as part of uh, uh, this process that we're going through um, i would say um, i'm giving you my personal opinion right now um, mm -hmm. maybe those who work on the plasma accelerators or uh, have a different opinion but the muon collider is far ahead so uh, laser plasma driven accelerators now you're talking about the plus e minus machines um, would be nice one thing that i learned in the last few years is the um, is the length of the beam delivery system the length of the beam uh, for instance the machine that I didn't talk about, uh, the C cube machine, right? So uh, I just wanted you to look at this picture. This is again the Fermilab site, and here the LENAC is four kilometers, but the beam delivery system is three kilometers. This is for a machine mm -hmm. which is capable of going to uh, 550 GeV, and it's mm -hmm. just very long beam delivery system. And the reason why it needs to be very long is because you don't want to put uh, in the transverse plane the electrons very much. So it needs to get bigger and bigger. So can we get to a 10 TeV plasma machine? Well, first thing that you need to do is plasma helps you uh, keep, the, keep the size of the LENAC uh, um, safe, but I think that the beam delivery system is still a very big deal. I don't think you know, there is enough work done. So there is plasma-based um, uh, lenses, if you like, to uh, get the beam delivery system going. I think there's a lot more research to be done. So I would, my feeling is that they are behind in terms of uh, demonstrating having a 10 TV scale E plus E minus machine. It's much further out in my opinion. Okay, okay, and uh, and uh, the last question that I had is, uh, do you think? I mean, uh, if uh, at the HLLHC we get a hint of dark matter or something uh, fascinating, uh, it will change the scenario, and uh, people are going to be more interested in building accelerators for the next. Uh, decade or, or I mean few decades. Uh, it's hard to say, right? You know, uh, if you can actually find dark matter signature, that would be fantastic. Uh, to explore it, yeah. You know, there are no deviations elsewhere that we're seeing. If all we see is a little bit of excess in uh, um, mono object searches that we're doing, then. Uh, there will have to be a lot more work done. And I think what's what's the right thing to do? I would say that you need to find um, the new physics deviations also alongside it so we can construct a machine to see where this dark matter, how the dark matter is coupled to us. Basically what I'm talking about is what is the mediator and what is its mass? If it's on the order of 10 TV, I think it bolsters the case for a machine like this. Um, yeah, but we already have a case for a machine like this, I think, from the Higgs that we found and uh, and our ability to measure uh, that well. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think there is a hand raised from TFR. So is there a question from yeah. the room? Um, right. Yeah, go ahead. Just one second. Just one second. Very nice talk, Shidala. Uh, thank you for it makes us so, uh, so I have one uh, comment and then one small question. Uh, yeah. So about this neutrino, I mean, that you showed uh, potentially hazardous. Uh, so uh, when I had a little bit of uh, knowledge about this muon collider and some R&D going on in Rutherford lab and some, some university in the UK in collaboration with Formilab. So there was this neutrino factory, like um, how to use, so basically, Marry muon collider with uh, this neutrino factory, like where you need very high intensity, high intense neutrino beam. So, is that a part of the you know uh, the neutrino community are still part of this uh, R and D uh, project, like using this neutrino that are coming out? Uh, so, uh, let me find. The, I don't know if I put that particular plot in here. Let me just check. 
Mm, no, I didn't do that. But um, the neutrino factory could be done, but it doesn't require most of this uh, thing, right? Uh, you don't really need to cool the muons enough. You know, in principle, all you need is the proton driver and and the target and the decay thing, and that's it, right? The neutrinos are you know going transversely a little farther away, but who cares? Uh, right. If you're only interested in neutrino factory, um, then all that you need is this. So if you build this for a muon collider, uh, then yeah, there's neutrino factory available for you. And I'm pretty sure that it will be used at some point. Now, uh, the big deal, though, if you want to convince people to build a collider, you need to demonstrate that cooling is doable and that you have. Yeah. Yeah. Of it. And uh, this is where I think that the bigger effort is. Yeah. yeah. But I'm pretty sure that if a muon collider uh, is done at Fermilab, uh, beam will be a neutrino part of the beam will be aimed at uh, at Dune, which is being built right now. Yeah. So, so that's exactly you. You get to my. Having mind. said that, there is one other issue there, though. Uh, LOE is a big deal for studying the neutrino physics, and uh, this would be a very high energy. Yeah, compared to what you probably would want for the distance. And uh, I don't know if that's, a, a, if that's an issue or not. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's basically brings my last comment, uh, last question. Uh, you know, as you said, the cost uh, wise, I mean, the civil engineering part, I mean, you are not talking of a very large circumference, like uh, 100 kilometer or whatever the FCC EE or HH1 is talking about. So, uh, the question is that technical challenges, but if you want to list the technical challenges in order of this is the most complicated one and, and you know, some kind of priority wise, um, I think probably you have showed it somewhere in your talk, but, but can you, can we sort of see that what are the really the, the, the key thing and then, and then the next one and then the next one, I mean, yeah, can we have such a thing or Okay. Uh, high field magnets, fast ramping magnets, they're important. Uh, high field magnets are actually a common thing between FCC, uh, PP, and this machine. Uh, now, uh, the solenoid, which is a different type of magnet, but still, uh, we're thinking HTS is the way to go. So some of the research is actually synergistic and uh, overlapping in many respects. So we can just, we can, we can do some of the research for A or B, and both, uh, either way, it will be used eventually. But you know, there are some specifics, of course, which are different for the two. But I think that we're far behind in terms of uh, getting a collider concept written, whereas FCPP, uh, FCCPP is much, much more matured, uh, I would say, concept that is on the table. Um, so uh, there are differences. So there's more work to be done in this for sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the next hand raised was I think by Govindada. So please go ahead. I think we have to skip the other question, but yeah, this could be last one. Okay, just uh, now this is just a comment about the muon collider. So that is the super neutrino beam. That collider is most of the part is too linear part of the detect uh, collider where muon will go and only one circular part. So the muon will go in these one linear sections where this is the neutron will go in the long distance there. And this is not the circular things. It will be the linear. So from where so, you have a neutron, yeah, 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 where yeah, you have a neutron. Uh, let me go back to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, that's the only. Yeah, I think uh, you were somewhere. If you look at this picture. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. This is the point. In this uh, straight sections, there maybe you will have it. Muon neutrino will come from there. Yeah, you can use that. But I, what I'm saying is that they're going to be high energy neutrinos. Now, of course, the, uh, the nuisance neutrinos, which I talked about in the other section, wherever that picture was, this nuisance neutrinos along the, uh, this purple line, those are now, uh, you know, this is collider ring. We're talking about 5 TV muons. So those are really, really high energy neutrinos. So I don't think you can do very much neutrino physics with that, uh, with that from the point of view of oscillations and things like that, right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. 
these I'm calling nuisance neutrinos, where the other ones we actually produce it to use them. Okay, so I think we need to stop here. Thank you, Shudra, for the nice talk and for others for the nice, interesting questions. Thank you, Shudra, again. And I think we can move on now. <laughs>